and Valley Danbury Library for having us. Um, so welcome everyone. We are part of Yale Science in the News and we give a series of talks every month. And today we're gonna to be presenting on From Guts to Galaxies, Evolution on Many Scales. So before we get into some awesome science, I did want to introduce a little bit about our speakers today. So we have three. Nora is gonna be starting us off with our very first talk and she is from the Department of Microbial Pathogenesis and her research is on the gut microbiome and drug metabolism. And her fun fact is that she can wiggle her ears. Um, Krishan is our second speaker of the day, and he is in the Department of Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry, and he researches ancient RNA molecules and bacteria. And his fun fact is that he can play the flute. Uh, lastly, uh, Harrison will be presenting our last talk, and he's in the astronomy department here at Yale, and he researches jellyfish galaxies, and he plays competitive badminton. Okay, with that, Ooh. Just Okay, so you've probably seen a figure or something like this uh, showing or representing the evolution of animals from sea to land over the course of millions of years. Um, so this is referring to biological evolution and basically uh, over the course of time, the species in a population can uh, change in appearance or the way they function. But today our talk is going to be on a much broader sense. And so we're gonna be referring to evolution on a much broader sense. And we're briefly describing it as the process of change over time in response to the changing environment. So when we talk about evolution on many scales, the first scale that we're gonna be discussing is evolution over the time scale. So, this time scale represents billions of years with today marking um, zero marking present day and then minus 14 uh, means 14 billion years ago, approximately uh, the beginning of the universe. So Nora's talk is going to start us off with uh, changes in the bacteria in our gut. And these changes, evolution of these bacteria happen over the course of weeks to months, uh, maybe a year or two. So quick changes. Next, Harrison is going to be talking, oh, sorry, Krishan is going to be talking us, talk, talking about phylogenetics and how all species are related down to the last universal common ancestor, which is thought to be about 4 billion years old. And then we're going to have Harrison talk about um, evolution of stars and galaxies, and his talk is going to be talking about changes over millions and millions of years, and some of the earliest stars that are in galaxies are thought to be about 13 billion years ago. So this is pretty wide range of changes that we're seeing from weeks to millions of years in our talk today. Next, we have the size scale, so a spatial scale. Um, basically, Nora's talk is going to be talking uh is going to be discussing bacterial cells which are so so small much smaller than a single strand of hair um and then if we kind of zoom out a little bit there we have um Krishan's talk and he's going to be talking about slightly larger like species um so birds crocodiles um other sorts of mammals etc and then finally if we're zooming out even more Harrison is going to be talking about um, a massive stars and galaxies. And that's going to be um, very different than a bacterial cell. So as you can see, our talk covers both uh, time and uh, space in terms of evolution. And with that, uh, we are going to get started. So I'm going to ask Nora to share her screen and I'll stop mine. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, as Brahmi introduced, uh, my name is Nora. I am a first year PhD student studying microbiology. And today I'm very excited to talk to you about a topic that I'm very passionate about. And that is uh, this ecosystem of healthy germs that lives inside of you called the microbiome that evolves over the course of your lifetime. So to get us started, uh, I'll give you a brief primer as to what you can expect in this talk. So today I'm going to be talking about your microbiome, this ecosystem of healthy germs, uh, bacteria, microbes 
that lives on and inside of you and evolves over the course of your life in response to a number of different factors. Uh, I'll be talking about what this microbiome is and why you should care that you have a microbiome and the many benefits of the microbiome that you gain as a human person. Uh, on top of that, I'll be talking about the fact that your microbiome evolves over the course of your lifetime. It's very dynamic and changing to a number of factors, especially age. So to dive right into everything, uh, this is you. So uh, you're pretty cool after all, you're coming here tonight to learn some science, uh, but what makes you a human? Well, this could be a very deep and philosophical question, but at the most basic level, you as a human person are made up of these building blocks of life called cells. And your human body is made up of about 30 trillion cells. This seems like a big number, but just to orient you as to how massive this is, if you stacked 30 trillion people on top of each other, that would be enough people to stack about 2.3 million Earths. So humongous. But what if I told you that you're not just a human person? You actually also have this ecosystem of germ, healthy germs, these bacteria and other microbes that lives inside of you and in particular in your gut. And if you thought your 30 trillion human cells were lonely, don't worry, you have about 30 trillion bacterial cells that constitute your microbiome. So uh, that is your microbiome, all the bacteria that lives on you, uh, the human host body. And a couple of important things to note here is that in terms of size, uh, these bacterial cells are much smaller than our human cells are. That means they're able to fit about 30 trillion of them just in this small space of the gut. Even more interesting is that the 30 trillion cells that make you a human are cells that all come together to make you one human person, one organism. Bacteria are one-celled organisms, so each of the 30 trillion bacterial cells are each 30 trillion uh, unique organisms. So absolutely amazing and very fascinating. But why should you care that you have some healthy germs that lives inside of you? And there are actually a number of benefits uh, that you as a person gain from having a microbiome. Uh, for starters, uh, your microbiome aids in the breakdown of food and production of certain nutrients, especially those that you struggle to produce yourself. On top of that, uh, your microbiome uh, helps support your immune system in its development and defense against uh, disease-causing threats. Uh, last, but most certainly not least, there are a number of other benefits, but here are just a couple. Um, your microbiome influences the health of other organs throughout the body, so your brain health, heart health. Uh, there's definitely a lot of work that's being done to understand these connections, but uh, it appears that it does influence other organs throughout our body. Uh, just to convince you a little bit more as to the benefits that you have from having a microbiome, I'll talk a little bit more about how your microbiome supports your immune system and start with talking about how you would go about studying this. So typically we study the microbiome in the context of animal model systems and you can go about studying an animal that you grow up that has a microbiome compared to one that you grow up without a microbiome. And that is considered to be a germ-free animal. So if you were to go about studying the immune system uh, and how it develops uh, in an animal that does have a microbiome, you can see that on this scale of better to worse, it does fairly well in terms of how it develops. But compare that to an animal without a microbiome, a germ-free animal, and you can see that it does uh, significantly worse in how its immune system develops. So the takeaway here is that if you didn't have a microbiome, your immune system development would be uh, significantly impaired. Um, so thank goodness that you do have one. Uh, but if that wasn't convincing enough, let's look about how you would do uh, microbiome versus not having a microbiome in the context of getting sick. So this is uh, actual published scientific data in which they measured the amount of a disease-causing pathogen uh, over the course of several days after an infection. So here what you can see for an animal with a microbiome 
the amount of pathogen goes up initially over the course of the first few days, which that makes sense. That would be uh, analogous to you getting sick if you caught some bad bug. Um, so the animal gets sick, but then after a couple of days, you then, you then see that they start to get better and the amount of this disease causing pathogen goes down. So they get sick and then they get better. Compare that to an animal without a microbiome and you can see that uh, the amount of pathogen goes up as this animal gets sick and continues to get sick with no end in sight. So again, uh, you can see here that your defense against uh, any kind of threat and recovery against an infection would be uh, very impaired and stunted if you didn't have a microbiome. So hopefully this has convinced you that there are a number of benefits that you as a person gain from having all of these bacteria live inside of you. But on the flip end of that, why would bacteria care to live inside people? And to talk about this, I'll bring up a quote from a former mentor of mine where he once said that the human body is the Manhattan of microbial living. It's a great place to live with plenty of resources, but the real estate is at a premium. What does he mean here? So uh, apparently our gut is a pretty good place for certain bacteria to live. Uh, it's a source of shelter. And on top of that, the food we eat can then become food for the bacteria that live there. So uh, shelter, food, what more could they want? But because it's such a great place to live, that means there is a lot of competition between the bacteria that live there. So that competition gives rise to this really amazing evolution in dynamics for what bacteria are living there that I'll go into more detail next. But uh, to get started with this, how did you get a microbiome in the first place? The current consensus is that when you were in development in the womb, uh, you did not have a microbiome. But when you were born, that is when you also gained a microbiome. And then over the course of the early years of your development in childhood, your microbiome will undergo significant development and remodeling to mature. So I will go through uh, this evolution in these changes in a little bit more detail, but to get us started, I'll bring up some of the main characters that you'll see me referring to throughout this evolution. Uh, so in blue here, you have the firmicutes. In green, these, uh, these critters are the bacteroides, and then in yellow, actinobacteria, and pink, proteobacteria. What is not important here are the names. I bring up the names just to tell you what they're called, um, but I'll be using these cute little icons and um, these colors as more of a reference throughout the rest of this presentation. What is important to note here is that uh, comparing these two is not like comparing uh, cats to dogs. This is like comparing all of, the, uh, all of the mammals to all of the insects. So there's a lot of internal species diversity that I'm glossing over because it would just be far too complex to summarize uh, without me going on and on and on. But anyways, there is a lot of amazing diversity within each of these subsets but you can still compare them at a more zoomed out level. But anyway, diving right into that evolution, this is what your microbiome probably looked like when you were about one years old. So you can see that there are a lot of the little critters that are in yellow, some of the critters that are in blue, but let's compare that to what your microbiome looked like at age three. And you can see that your microbiome has changed dramatically you have a loss of a lot of these critters that were in yellow replaced by a lot of these critters that were in blue. So just within a few short years of your early life, your microbiome has uh, matured and developed just like you were developing uh, going from an infant to a young child. But what about comparing your microbiome as a three-year-old to like say when you were 30? And here you, you can see uh, your microbiome is not changing very much. You may have a loss of one of the critters that were in green replaced by a critter that was in blue, but overall your microbiome uh, over the course of the remainder of your childhood and adulthood is stable. And we can see this summarized here in this graph where you can see again the results of what your microbiome composition looked like over the course of ages one to 100. And as a reminder, you can see here that your microbiome is changing pretty dramatically in the first few years of your life, 
not changing very significantly over the course of most of your adulthood. Uh, that being said, there are subtle changes that can happen, but overall it's a pretty stable population. I'll next direct your attention to the changes that can happen to your microbiome then towards uh, the older ages of life and start by reminding you, this is probably what your microbiome looked like as you were a young adult. Compare that to when you're an older adult and you can see there are, again, some pretty significant changes to your microbiome. You have a uh, loss of these critters that were in blue replaced by these ones in green. So this uh, imbalance where you have so many of the ones that were in green, that is associated with a number of different uh, health effects in terms of uh, increased susceptibility to infection, increased inflammation. Um, so this is kind of an imbalance of your microbiome that is reflected um, by your health and affected by your age. That being said, uh, how your microbiome becomes this is not something that's permanent or set in place. And there are a number of different environmental factors that you as a person can control to affect how your microbiome evolves. And one of those is the food that you eat is not just affecting you, it's also affecting the microbes that live inside of you. And we can understand this in the context of comparing the critters that were in green and the critters that are in blue. And start by looking at, the, at this in the context of a high fat, high sugar, more imbalanced diet. And here you can see that there are uh, a pretty significant imbalance between the critters that are in blue to the ones that are in green. You can barely see this uh, green one here crowded out by all of the blue. Compare that to a more balanced diet and you can see that there are still are more of the critters that are in blue, but it's a little bit more balanced by the ones that are in green. Comparing these two side by side, and again, you can see that there's drastically more of the critters that were blue in the high fat, high sugar diet compared to that of a more balanced diet. However, this is not a permanent change of your microbiome. And if you were to start on this high fat, high sugar diet and then switch onto a more balanced diet, you can see that your microbiome is uh, changing over the course of a few weeks so that even though it started out looking much more like this high fat, high sugar microbiome, it then changes by the end of several weeks to look like that of a more balanced diet microbiome. So your microbiome is constantly changing and evolving in response to these factors uh, in that the food that you eat is also affecting the microbes that live inside of you. So that's one way that you can kind of control the evolution of the bacteria that live there. So the takeaway from all of this, I've mentioned if you have too many of the green bacteria, that's not a great thing. If you have too many of the blue bacteria, that's also not a great thing. So how do we reconcile all of this? Are these microbes our friends or are they our foes? And the big takeaway here is that having a diverse range of the bacteria that can live in your microbiome, a diverse microbiome is considered more of a healthy microbiome. And while there are factors that we can't control, one of the factors that is more within the realm of our control is the food with, that we eat. So having a balanced diet where uh, you eat many different foods, uh, that can support having a healthy microbiome. So uh, coming from New Haven here, uh, don't only eat New Haven pizza, uh, try to expand what you're eating in your diet and your microbiome will evolve to thank you. So hopefully here uh, you've learned about what your microbiome is and how it's evolving over the course of your life and that this evolution is happening on a very short time scale, just the days of your life, uh, the year span of your life. Next, uh, Krishan will be talking about how we as humans came to be and how this evolution uh, went over the course of several billions of years. And with that, I will stop sharing and let Krishan take it away. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. Um, just real quick before we start, I think my parents are online, so I wanted to give a quick shout out to my mom and dad. Um, 
So uh, my name is Krishan Fernando. I'm a fourth year PhD student studying molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about how we're all related. All right, so I want to start off with this critter on the left here. So this is a type of bacterium. And uh, what's interesting about this particular type of bacterium is that it is a member of the gut microbiome. So this is one of the bacteria that Nora was talking about in her portion of the talk. Um, on the right here, we have a creature that's known as a human, uh, maybe a human that you've seen before. <laughs> um, so, of course, uh, these two organisms have a very special relationship, um, naturally, since the one on the left lives inside the one on the right. But their connection actually goes much deeper than that. Uh, in fact, they actually share a common ancestor. And this ancestor, for now, I'll refer to just as Luca, or the last universal common ancestor. So uh, in my portion of the talk, I hope to tell you a little bit more about how these two organisms are related, what exactly LUCA is, and along the way, we'll learn some interesting facts about evolution as well. But before we uh, get to all of that, we need to actually define what is evolution. Um, so in this case, I'm talking about uh, biological evolution, sort of uh, to differentiate from the types of evolution that, that Nora and Harrison will be talking about. Um, so evolution is sort of rooted in this idea that organisms pass on traits from generation to generation. So what exactly is a trait? So consider this giraffe, for instance. You'll notice that there's a lot of notable characteristics about this giraffe. For instance, it's long neck, brown spots, it's adorable smile. All of these we can consider traits. Another thing that giraffes are known to do is they're known to have offspring. So there we go. Now this, this giraffe is a parent and it has a child and the child has uh, a lot of the traits that the parent has as well. Now, not all of tra the traits are passed on from generation to generation, but the ones that are passed on, we refer to as heritable traits. What's actually happening uh, it, in order for these traits to be passed on um, is something called DNA is being passed on. So essentially DNA is sort of like this code that dictates what makes a human a human, what makes a giraffe a giraffe, and so on and so forth. So when an organism has offspring, the DNA is passed on, and with them, the heritable traits are passed on as well. So what evolution, uh, at least as it pertains to my portion of the talk, what that really concerns is this question of how do these traits change over time, especially in response to the different environmental factors that these organisms might be facing. So historically, they've been there have been these two ma major competing ideas of, of evolution, um, and I'll uh, go into them in a little bit. Um, but the the major proponents of these two ideas were uh, this one guy named Charles Darwin and a guy named Jean Baptiste Lamarck. So now let's actually get into the theories. So we'll start off with Lamarck's idea of evolution, which is called Lamarckism. So let's consider some giraffes again. So you see these giraffes are kind of short. They can barely reach the tree uh, in order to eat the leaves from the tree. So according to Lamarck's theory, what might have happened is that these giraffes might have stretched their necks just a little bit to try to, to reach the leaves a little bit better. And then they would have passed on those traits to the next generation. And then the, the next generation would also stretch their necks just a little bit higher and so on and so forth. And over the course of many generations, you'd eventually get giraffes that are very tall and can very easily reach the leaves of the tree. Darwin had a very different way of looking at this. So Darwin looked around him and saw that there were already giraffes that, uh, there, there were already animals that had a lot of variation in them. So according to Darwin's theory, what might have been the case is that a long time ago, there might have been giraffes that had a variety of neck sizes, some of them short, some of them very tall. And this next part is probably going to be a little bit morbid, but according to Darwin's theory, the shorter giraffes probably would have died because they couldn't have easily reached the leaves in the tree in order to eat and survive. So then only the, the tall neck giraffes would have been able to actually pass on their traits to the next generation. And because of that, you'd eventually get only tall giraffes. So the key differences between these two ideas is that uh, according to Lamarck's idea, organisms are changing directly in response to the environment. But on the other hand, Darwin's idea is that the environment is simply selecting the winners from among the organisms. 
So there's already variability within organisms and the environment is sim simply selecting which of those traits are favored and which ones, uh, which organisms are going to be able to survive to pass on their traits to the next generation. So thus far, I've been talking about sort of very small changes, just short necked versus tall necked giraffes. But I promised you earlier to show you how bacteria and humans, which are very different, um, are related to one another. So really what we need to talk about is how do new species arise? So Darwin uh, was doing his, his uh, investigations while he was sailing through the Galapagos Islands. And um, he noticed that there were a lot of these different species of birds that had very different types of beaks, some very big, some very small. And these different types of beaks were adapted for eating different types of food, some for insects, some birds were better at eating seeds, some were better at eating fruits. Um, and according to Darwin's um, ideas and what scientists these days believe as well is that a long time ago, there might have been just one bird species on the Galapagos Islands, but there were probably a, a variety of different food sources. So what may have happened is that subpopulations of these bird species may have started to eat different types of foods, and they might have slowly started adapting uh, to eating those particular types of food. And through the processes that we had described earlier that Darwin had described, um, these birds may have evolved and slowly changed into the number of different bird species that we see on the Galapagos Islands today. And of course, this uh, original bird is the common ancestor of all of these bird species. So thus far, we've been talking really about the theoretical foundations of evolution. But uh, in order to actually compare, for instance, bacteria and humans, we need more of a practical tool. And that tool we call phylogenetics. So phylogenetics is the study of evolutionary relationships among biological entities. And the basic tool of phylogenetics is called a phylogenetic tree, which looks sort of like this. So basically, a phylogenetic tree is, a, is very similar to a family tree. But instead of showing you the relationships between different family members, a phylogenetic tree is showing you the relationships between entire species. So this particular phylogenetic tree is called a tree of life because it's showing you how all modern life forms on the planet are related to one another. And you can see the, the major divisions of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, and how they're all connected to one another. So this is kind of a complicated tree, though. So to actually understand what's going on with a phylogenetic tree, we have to zoom in and really uh, study a very simple, uh, a much more simple example. So here's a phylogenetic tree that shows us how birds and dinosaurs are related to each other. So I'll take you guys through this uh, this tree and tell you all the parts and how to read this tree. And together, we can kind of understand how phylogenetic trees work. So this particular tree has uh, three different categories. It has the crocodilians, dinosaurs, and bird species in blue, green, and this red orange at the bottom. So um, the tree is organized from old to new. So on the left, you see older organisms. And on the right, you see newer organisms. Over here, wherever you see the end of one of these lines and you see a picture there, these are, the, these are called tips or taxa. And basically what these are, just the different species that we want to compare on the tree. Next, I want to point out these, uh, the actual lines, which are called edges or branches. And basically, these are just the connections that are showing us how these different species are related to one another. Lastly, I want to point out uh, these points where the, the lines connect with one another. And these points are called nodes. But what they really represent are ancestors. Basically, what this particular point is representing is an ancestor of all of the bird species, because you can follow the branches of the tree from that point all the way to, to the right to get to all of the different bird species that we see on the tree. So now let's do a little bit of practice on reading this tree. So if you look at this point on the left over here, so this node represents the ancestor of all of the species on the tree because you can follow the branches of the tree to get to all of the different species from this point. This next point here represents the common ancestor of all the dinosaur species, because you could specifically get to just the dinosaur species uh, by following the branches from old to new from this point. 
However, you can also notice that you can get to the bird species from this point as well. So this leads us to a very interesting conclusion here. So I had told you that this tree shows us how birds and dinosaurs are related to one another. And that is true, but that isn't really the full truth. In fact, the full truth is that birds aren't just related to dinosaurs. Birds actually are dinosaurs. That's right. That might not be uh, something that you might, may have known, but uh, the reality is that not all dinosaurs died out. And you can really see that on the tree here. A lot of the, di uh, some of the dinosaur species actually survived. And the ones that survived gave, uh, went on to, to give rise to all of the modern bird species that we see today. So scientists actually consider birds to be uh, not just relatives of dinosaurs, but, the, but actually dinosaurs themselves, and the, the last surviving members of, of the group of dinosaurs. So uh, I, I also wanted to show a, a very interesting uh, application of, of phylogenetic trees to something that might be more relevant uh, to your lives, which is uh, something that you might recognize as the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So you can also use phylogenetics to show how uh, SARS-CoV-2 strains are related to one another. So this phylogenetic tree here, uh, instead of showing you changes over the course of millions of years, is showing you changes over just the past three years since the, the COVID pandemic really started. And you can see here different strains of SARS-CoV-2 and uh, which strains, strains are emerging and stuff like that. And uh, it's really important to make phylogenetic trees like this because um, public health officials can use trees like this to really understand what are emerging variants of coronavirus, and they can really tailor their uh, public health interventions in order to respond to what uh, the new data is and what the emerging variants are. So and with that, I wanted to take us back to this full tree that we saw before. So uh, be at the beginning, I promised to show you guys the relationship between bacteria and humans. And we've learned a lot, and I think we're finally ready to actually do that. So we'll put bacteria on the tree over here. And humans go on the tree over here because we're considered eukaryotes. And you can see it um, if you follow the branches of the tree to where they meet. Uh, as I mentioned before, that's how you find an ancestor. And you can see that there is an ancestor between the bacteria and humans here. But what you can you can also notice that actually all of the the different points on this tree are actually leading to the same point, the same ancestor. And this is a really special point because we call this the last universal common ancestor or LUCA. And this is a really cool organism because what, what this really is, is this organism that lived a long time ago, uh, the species that lived a very long time ago from which all modern species are descended, whether that's you, the bacteria inside you, your pet, all of these organisms are descended from LUCA. So what do we know about LUCA? What did it look like? Where did it live? Well, I'm pleased to say that scientists have been working very hard on this problem, and they have actually figured out exactly what LUCA looks like, and it looks a little bit like this. No, I'm just kidding. That's, that's just a, a Disney movie. LUCA doesn't look like this. Um, the reality is that LUCA probably looked uh, like a, any ordinary microscopic organism that you would see on the planet today. Um, and it probably looked very similar to any modern organism because it's our ancestor. So it gave rise to all of the bacteria and eukaryotes and archaea that we see today. So if you were to look at it under the microscope, it probably wouldn't look very different from any microscopic organism you'd see on the planet today. But uh, one interesting thing I can say about LUCA is where, where it probably lived, which is probably in a deep sea vent like this. So basically, um, as you can see here, you see like smoke and steam coming out of these, these uh, deep sea vents over here. And uh, basically, the reason why scientists think that this would have been a good place for LUCA to live is because LUCA is probably very primitive compared to modern organisms. And while it had a lot of the same machinery, it probably wasn't as good as, make, at, as, good at making uh, some of the nutrients that it needed to survive. So it probably relied on its environment to take up different nutrients and resources to survive. So a place like this would have been a good place for that because it's really hot, as you can see here. And there's uh, a lot of chemical reactions that are going on to produce all of these complex nutrients that LUCA would have uh, been able to take up and use to survive. So this probably would have been 
an ideal place for the earliest life forms, including Luca, to have lived. So, and with that, I want to take us back to this, this big tree of life. So uh, in the past couple of minutes, I've tried to do my best to, to give you guys a, a little bit of a history of the entire uh, evolution of modern organisms from the time of Luca, um, which lived a little over 4 billion years ago. So it's a long time ago, and this is we're talking about a really big scale, but the entire universe is even bigger than that. So I want to bring us back to the timeline to really give you guys a sense of that. So Nora's talk was focusing on the human gut microbiome, uh, which can change over the course of days or weeks. And usually we're looking at evolution uh, in under 100 years. I've been talking about the evolution of species since the time of Luca, which lived over 4 billion years ago. And next, Harrison will be talking about the evolution of galaxies and stars. And the earliest stars were formed over 13 billion years ago. And we're talking about spatial scales that are way, way bigger than anything that Nora and I have, have been talking about. So with that, I will let Harrison take it away. All right, um, just making sure, can I just get a thumbs up just that people can see my presentation? Oh. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Harrison Sushiro. I am a second year PhD student in the Department of Astronomy here at Yale University. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about the end of a galaxy's life and how galaxies, these absolutely enormous structures we see in the universe, um, come to an end. and how we'll typically how I'm going to kind of define this um, for the for the purposes of this talk is when a galaxy ends up no longer forming any new stars. And that is sort of the definition that we'll use um, for for this uh, for how we define a galaxy's life. So I'll open with um, one of my favorite images in astronomy. Um, this was taken in 1990 um, by that little satellite in the corner there, the Voyager 1 probe, as it was flying out of the solar system. And you might notice a little tiny speck there um, cutting across the top of the image. And that little tiny speck is planet Earth. And to really uh, impress upon you the scales that we're talking about here and just how large space is, um, everything that you have previously heard from Nora and Krishan um, has happened on that tiny little dust speck. So if we start on planet Earth, um, we're going to zoom this camera out and show you just how big the Milky Way actually is. <clears throat> so you can start, we'll start with the Earth. You can actually see the International Space Station um, orbiting around the Earth as that little orange uh, line. And then we'll start pulling the camera back. So you can start to see um, the outer planets of the solar system. We'll keep zooming out. Soon the solar system is just a point of light. You see the stars all around the solar system start to move and then boom we reach the total disk of the milky way um, and it's very large and very beautiful so um obviously we do not know exactly what the milky way looks like because we are stuck within the milky way disk so we can't actually see it um, from well outside of the milky way um, but what we can do is we can take a galaxy that we think looks roughly similar to the milky way and um learn about the Milky Way using it. So um, this is a nearby galaxy that we think is quite similar to the Milky Way. Um, and just how big is it, is it really? Um, one way to think about this is uh, that for about 100 years or so, um, radio signals from Earth have been careening through space at the speed of light. Now, the speed of light is roughly uh, 600 million miles per hour, so it's exceedingly fast. Um, and those have been expanding through space at, at roughly 100 years for about 100 years. Now, if I were to put a dot on this uh, galaxy as to how big that is compared to the size of the galaxy, um, how big do you think it is? Well, I'm about to do that and don't blink. Did you see it? Probably not because it is ultimately extremely small. And this is the extent of humanity's impact on the galaxy, of, on, on the Milky Way. 
So the distance of this uh, of this galaxy from one end to the other is roughly 100,000 light years. So a light year is traveling at the speed of light, this 600 million miles per hour. Um, how far does it actually travel in a year? So when you hear the term light year, think distance. It's not actually a unit of time. And, you know, it's 580,000, thousand, 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 thousand miles, an absolutely absurdly huge number. Um, so to uh, the scales that we're talking about on this uh, level, they're absolutely enormous compared to everything you've heard of, heard from so far. So before we get into how a galaxy can stop forming stars and come to an end, um, I need to tell you exactly what galaxies are made up of. And galaxies are made of roughly um, three big components. Um, the first, obviously, is stars. Um, galaxies have contained on the order of billions of stars. Um, galaxies can also have gas. Um, stars are actually made up mostly of gas. And um, the gas that you see when we look through, say, the Milky Way, um, at, or at other galaxies, it's often emitting its own light because it can be very, very hot. Um, there's also dust, and dust are these just giant um, grains made up of, you know, uh, tens of thousands of different atoms. And this this dust, we normally see it as if it's in front of a bright source. Um, so if there's a lot of background light, um, the dust actually will absorb a lot of that light, so it appears as these kind of dark streaks on the sky that you can see in the image uh, there. So if you've been following uh, space news um, over the past year or so, you might have seen this image um, taken by the James Webb Space Telescope, which successfully launched um, a little over a year ago. Um, and this galaxy, and this is of a group of galaxies known as Stefan's Quintet. Um, this is one of my favorite, another one of my favorite images currently in astronomy. It's my phone lock screen. I love it a lot. Um, and as an astronomer, I can teach you a lot about galaxies um, just from this image alone. So let's go through a few. So the first is that, um, as I said, galaxies are often made up of gas, stars, and dust. And if you have all three of these components, what you'll have is in a galaxy is a lot of this sort of substructure. So in this image of this galaxy, you can see a lot of these kind of spiral arms. Um, galaxies can have bars and rings and all of this really beautiful structure within the overall galaxy. Um, that is caused by this gas and dust. However, you can also have galaxies that are just made up of stars. So unlike the galaxy sort of in the center of the image, um, we have this, um, this other galaxy made up of just stars. And you can see they actually look quite different. Um, this galaxy is quite uniform. It's just sort of a elliptical blob of stars, and it doesn't have a lot of the beautiful substructure you see if it were to have gas and dust. Um, you can also know, notice that galaxies um, interact with one another um, quite a lot, and they are actually merging. With, they often merge with one another. So um, this uh, feature on the bottom of the image is actually of three galaxies. Um, on the left, you can see two galaxies that are about to finish merging together, um, and then this whole uh, system is about to merge with the galaxy on the right, and you can see all these really beautiful um, interactions and tails being created as gravity sort of combines these galaxies together. And lastly, um, if we just look beyond this uh, group of galaxies, Stefan's Quintet, you can see that the, there are tons of galaxies in the universe. And ultimately, the uh, universe is filled with galaxies, many, many billions of galaxies in total. So to bring us back a little bit, let's talk about our nearest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, and it's located 2.5 million light years away, a lot closer than that group of galaxies before, which was about 300 million light years away. Um, and it's and on a if you're actually looking in the night sky on a clear night um, with not a lot of light pollution, um, you can actually see it with the naked eye. Um, this is a photo that I took back in 2020 with my phone, and you can actually see the Andromeda galaxy um, up in the corner there as that kind of fuzzy blob. Um, but there's actually a problem the, uh, for both the Milky Way and Andromeda. And what it is, is the two galaxies are actually on a collision course with one another. And they're actually moving towards each other, and they're going to collide in a few billion years. So if we were to take this same photo um, many billions of years in the future, um, what the night sky will actually look like is this, where suddenly this little tiny fuzzy blob is now dominating the night sky because they're actually about to collide with one another. So... Um, what does this actually look like? Um, we can actually turn to computer simulations to show this. So I will set these galaxies moving towards each other. Um, you can see the Milky Way now on the left, Andromeda on the right. 
They're going to collide. Um, most of the stars, they're very small compared to the distances between them. So the stars don't really collide with one another, but all of the gas and dust will. And what you can see is at the very end of this um, simulation is that the galaxy that you get at the end looks a lot different than both the Milky Way and Andromeda looked like at the very start. Um, I can sort of show you this if I kind of take a before and after snapshot. Um, and you can see that on the left, you have a galaxy that has these kind of spiral arms and a lot of gas and dust, and it's very blue. And in astronomy, when I say blue, uh, think young stars, because only the youngest of stars that do not last very long um, are going to be blue like this. And at the end, on the right, you can see this end product, which doesn't have a lot of young stars, and it doesn't have a lot of that substructure that you would expect um, from gas and dust. So something is really changing. And this is generally a trend that you will see in astronomy. Galaxies mostly fall into one of these two uh, bins of objects. You either get these blue star forming factories with really beautiful spiral arms, or you get these quote unquote red and dead elliptical galaxies. And so what we want to ex explore is how do we go from one to the other? And how does a galaxy end up coming to it, its lifespan where it's no longer making new stars? How does that lifespan come to an end on the right? So to, to jump back a little bit, we would like to explore how stars actually form in the first place. And another one of the uh, beautiful images that James Webb provided us is of this um, giant structure known as the Carina Nebula that is located within the Milky Way. And within these beautiful blobs of gas and dust, this is actually where brand new stars are being formed. And a key takeaway that I want you to keep in mind is that in order to make stars, you need to have cold gas. And you might be wondering, well, why does it have to be cold? Aren't stars extremely hot? Why wouldn't you make stars out of hot gas? Why does it need to be cold? And the way to consider this is think about the mechanism that you use to take a giant blob of gas and form a star out of it. And realistically, what you need is gravity and time. Gravity is just a force that wants things to come together and stick together. And so if you can set this big gas cloud collapsing and have it end, end up end up compressing itself into an object that is so dense that it turns into a star, this is how you can actually make uh, give birth to brand new stars um, from these very large um, dust clouds. And so and to really kind of nail this home, um, we can compare what this looks like on the particle scale. So gas is just a bunch of little tiny particles moving around. And the hotter the gas is, um, the less compressed the gas will be, and the more the particles will be kind of moving around and bouncing around. Um, so you can really kind of intuitively understand that a cold gas is way more likely to compress with gravity um, than this hot gas, which will struggle a lot more to actually kind of have all the particles stick together. So to bring us back to the Crina Nebula and our kind of takeaway, there's two ways to actually look at this statement. Um, the first is that you need gas, obviously. If your car does not have any fuel in the tank, the car isn't going to run. And then you also need cold gas. So you, it's just having gas alone isn't enough. It needs to be in the appropriate state so that gravity can actually compress it into a new star. So to bring us back to our little computer simulation of the Milky Way and Andromeda colliding with each other, um, two things are actually happening. The first thing is that when these galaxies merge, um, well, the stars kind of all pass through each other, the gas and dust doesn't. So they have, all these dust clouds and gas clouds are going to collide, and this rapid compression of gas is going to cause this giant burst of new stars. And then that will actually exhaust all of your uh, available gas. And then any gas that's remaining in the galaxy that hasn't been turned into a new star, it's going to be heated up so much that it'll be too hot to form any brand new stars. So is there a way to, you might be asking yourself, okay, great. Um, if you have galaxies colliding with each other, that can cause them to stop forming stars. But is there a way to have this kind of process happen without any galaxy collisions whatsoever? And um, the answer is absolutely. And what I'll introduce to you now are galaxy clusters, which are these giant um, clusters of hundreds to thousands of galaxies um, that are all gravitationally bound to each other. So they're all orbiting within this um, big cluster. 
And you might notice as I show you this photo of a relatively nearby cluster known as the Coma Cluster, that most of the galaxies that you see are these elliptical red and dead late stage galaxies. And you might be wondering, that's a little strange. Where are all the spirals? Something must be going on within this cluster to cause all of these galaxies to die, quote unquote. So, and I can show, I can kind of quantitatively describe this to you. So if I plot the fraction of the total number of galaxies um, versus a, what is known as galaxy density. So how many galaxies are in the area um, for a individual galaxy um, on the left, think of like an isolated galaxy. That's sort of kind of by itself. And then on the right, we have these really dense regions of galaxy clusters. So in these kind of isolated cases, um, spiral galaxies make up roughly 60% of the total population and elliptical galaxies are actually quite rare. But then as you move towards this um, really dense um, galaxy cluster region, the trend actually flips and suddenly um, elliptical galaxies are dominating. So something must be going on to cause this um, trend for, to cause this trend. And of course, um, to, we'll, the key takeaway that you'll need to remember is that we need to have gas in the first place. And so something is happening as these galaxies move through the cluster to cause gas to be depleted from the galaxy overall. And what this, what, what's actually happening is this, um, this that gal the galaxy clusters are not just galaxies. If we were to look at this same cluster with an X-ray telescope, which is the brightness of the uh, of the how bright this galaxy is in x-ray is shown as this sort of pink and blue um what you can actually see is that there's a there's this massive amount of uh, extremely hot plasma and gas within the cluster itself that all of these galaxies are moving through so as the galaxy moves through the cluster it's going to sort of interact with this um with this really hot gas and plasma and it's going to affect the galaxy so what does this actually look like um so we'll start this galaxy moving, and what you'll see is that a lot of the gas and dust starts to get pulled off of the galaxy. And the way to think about this is imagine that you're driving um, down the road in a car and you stick your hand out of the window. And if you kind of hold your hand very flat, you won't feel a lot of force on your hand. But the moment you put your hand like this, almost like a sail against the wind, your hand gets flung to the back of the window. And this is the same exact mechanism that is happening to this galaxy. It's a process known as ram pressure stripping, where the stars, they're very heavy compared to their overall size. So they don't really feel this force very much, but all of the gas and dust does. So as the galaxy is moving, this gets all of the, the gas and dust gets ripped away from the galaxy and it gets it manifests as these really beautiful kind of jellyfish like tendrils as the galaxy is traveling. Um, and we see this in real data. So if we look at a couple different galaxies that are located within galaxy clusters, you can see these sort of jellyfish tentacles. And these galaxies are at different stages of their overall stripping. So a galaxy like uh, NGC 4858 on the left, it's roughly probably in the early to mid stages of its stripping. So it still has a lot of gas and dust to be removed. But then if you look at D100 in the top right, you can see that um, the, only, the only gas and dust left in the galaxy is right in the very center of the galaxy. And soon, um, as this galaxy continues to travel through the cluster, it will no longer have any gas to form any new stars. And eventually, this kind of beautiful spiral galaxy is going to turn into this um, red and dead elliptical galaxy at the end of its life at the end of its life cycle. So, to bring us back just to the timeline a little bit. Um, we the ultimate takeaway is that the universe on a galaxy scale is actually very very young so we have that the earliest galaxies start at around 13 billion years ago we have the present day and then in a roughly five four to five billion years um the andromeda galaxy and the milky way galaxy are going to collide but ultimately as far as galaxy evolution is concerned this is going to continue onwards for many billions if not trillions of years in the future so ultimately, there's a giant question mark on all of this evolution because we still have a lot of evolution left to go. So yeah, thank you.